happening in the watershed and to share how you can contribute to our efforts to protect and promote the health of the Northwest Branch. Now we have a pretty packed program tonight, as you can imagine, um, from the list of speakers. Um, so we're going to suggest and encourage you to utilize the chat feature in Zoom throughout um, as you have questions or comments or what have you. Um, when we get to the end, we will address as many as we can with the time that we have. And should we run out of time or be limited in the answers we can provide, um, we'll have a record of that and we'll be happy to coordinate with Anne and getting that additional information and those answers to you. So without further ado, um, the Northwest Branch, as you're probably very well familiar as the neighbors of Northwest Branch, is a tributary to the Anacostia River. Uh, it also falls within a large network of stream valley parks that are owned and operated by the Maryland National Capital Park and Planning Commission. So in addition to the Northwest Branch, we're responsible for managing nearly 500 of stream miles in Brittany, in addition to those various um, natural and recreational spaces that you see listed there. Uh, park Planning and Stewardship Division that I'm a part of, as well as Park Development and Public Affairs and Community Partnerships Divisions, among others, are all working together in order to protect these precious resources. And so you'll be hearing from myself as well as some other key players in that tonight. So one common theme in our work that you might not necessarily expect is stormwater. And what I mean specifically by stormwater is the precipitation that's running off of our roofs and our streets, our sidewalks, all those pavements and impervious surfaces that are making their way into storm drains. Now, the stormwater unfortunately doesn't really stop curbside. In fact, a lot of times it's making an all too short of a trip into our streams. And while the stormwater is making its journey across the landscape and across those impervious surfaces, it's picking up trash, debris, dirt, pollutants, and contaminants along the way. And so these kind of unwanted tag-alongs are also ending up within our streams. And in addition to those hitchhikers, we're also seeing a change in velocity of water entering our streams. So we're getting large and fast quantities coming in that are basically going to dramatically change the character of the stream. Banks start to erode, sediment is transported, things really become unstable and disruptive um, compared to what they would be in a natural system where these impervious surfaces are absent. So Montgomery Parks has to work pretty hard to offset these stormwater impacts because a lot of the stormwater impacts are happening off of park land before coming into our Stream Valley Park system. So kind of in addition to our dedication and our responsibility to manage the resources and provide you know, great park experiences, we're beholden to a stormwater permit. And it's a mouthful, you'll see it spelled out there. We call it the NIPTES MS4 permit for short. Um, that stormwater permit aims to reduce or eliminate the sources of stormwater pollution on parkland in Montgomery County, and it includes a requirement to treat 20% of the untreated impervious surfaces like those that I gave you an example of. <clears throat> and another way that we're stepping up to the plate um, when it comes to dealing with stormwater and evaluating our streams is through monitoring. And one of the approaches that we take is biological monitoring. So we have basically biological communities within the streams that are responding to the cumulative effects of a suite of pollutant and environmental stressors. Um, in particular, aquatic insects and benthic macroinvertebrates. So the things you see pictured here, that lovely Terranarsis we gave a shout out to in the very beginning of the presentation, or as an introduction. Um, as well as fish, amphibians, and reptiles can tell us quite a bit about the state of our streams. And what you would expect in a healthy stream with good water quality is an abundance and diversity of different types of animals. Now, as environmental stressors increase and we see streams start to decline, or in the graphic, I thought was kind of helpful, as we shift towards the red and an impacted state, you see a loss of diversity, a loss of those most sensitive species, and a decline in the counts of the animals therein. So you can kind of think of this shift of biological integrity and the structure and function 
as a six stream system. You have your causes or your triggers, increases in stormwater and pollutants, for example, your symptoms, failing banks, straightening of channels, transient unstable bottoms, and a diagnosis of biological impairment. So Montgomery Parks is keeping the pulse on our streams by examining the benthic macroinvertebrate communities in the spring and the fish communities in the summer along 75 meter stream segments established throughout the park system. Each of these biological groups are reacting differently. So we're gonna look at them both independently as well as together in order to gather information on stream impairment and health in a cumulative way. Also as part of kind of this holistic approach where we're trying to aim to get a complete picture of stream health, we're collecting supplemental data alongside the focused biological community information. So we take a look both in spring and summer at different habitat parameters, what habitat availability and condition looks like in stream, what it looks like within the uh, adjacent riparian areas. We look at a snapshot of water chemistry and a subset of parameters therein. And we look at the amphibian and reptile or the herpetofauna both in stream and within those riparian areas as well. And that helps us again, get more of a complete picture of what's going on at a given location at a given time, and then repeat visits along with working cooperatively with Montgomery County Department of Environmental Protection, Maryland Department of Natural Resources and others gives us a chance to look at stream conditions both over time and as a whole system of watersheds at different scales. So we can look very locally or we can look at something like the Northwest Branch in its entirety. So without getting too complex, and I rec recognize that some of this looks a little daunting at first, what we're doing in essence in the field is counting an identification of organisms. So we collect and count and release the fish at those 75 meter stretches, and then we collect a benthic macroinvertebrate sample that is processed in our lab. But the data itself goes beyond those counts. Rather, it's going into a series of metrics that are representative of the communities. So we're looking at different metrics that have been tested and validated and allow us to basically capture community responses to stream change in a predictable and measurable way. So for example, in both the fish and benthic macroinvertebrate communities, we have total number of species or taxa richness. You would expect, as I said earlier, more taxa, more species at a healthier stream system and a decline in areas where they've um, experienced prolonged stress and impairment. So from these metrics, which sometimes we do look individually at, we also combine them together and look at an overall score for each biological community. That's referred to as an index of biotic integrity or IBI. So we have a benthic IBI or a bibi, I'll refer to it as, a fish IBI and a fibi. Um, and then we also will combine them sometimes um, in order to get an average stream condition. And that can be thought of as a rating or a grade that translates into a narrative of excellent, good, fair, and poor. And so you can see that breakdown kind of over here. All right, so let's start to bring it back into the Northwest Branch. This is a look at our biological monitoring that parks completed in 2020. You'll see we hit um, 10 subwatersheds, the Northwest Branch included, and we have a variety of different colored sample types there. Um, we monitored 23 sites in total um, that had some different focuses. We do focus on targeted monitoring, so we have annual sites. You'll see those marked in red. There's two of those in Northwest Branch that we monitored this year. And we do pre and post restoration monitoring, orange and green respectively. And so here in Northwest Branch, you can see we did some pre restoration monitoring. We're going to talk a little bit more about that this evening as well. So drilling in a little more, let's start with the annual monitoring in Northwest Branch. You'll see we have two long-term biological monitoring stations that are established at almost the very bottom of the Northwest Branches portion within Montgomery County. 
course, Northwest Branch is continuing into PG, but our responsibility is on the opposite side of the county line. Um, and with these stations, um, you're seeing what is almost the entirety of Northwest Branch's um, portion in Montgomery County. So what you're seeing mapped is the entirety of Northwest Branch and the areas that are north here, or approximately north upstream, is going to be the area that's contributing to the downstream stream conditions here at our biological monitoring sites. So that's a very large catchment area. In fact, we're looking at about 29 square miles here of water and land contributing to the biological assessment that we're taking right at that little point. Um, you'll also notice that, and from living um, and working and enjoying this area um, along Northwest Branch, Stream Valley Park, that the Northwest Branch watershed has a lot of build out and development to it. And um, our sites itself are right downstream of 495. So there's a lot going on at this particular station. So let's take a look. Hey, Rachel, real quick to interrupt. Um, yes. your, your audio is a little bit staticky. I don't know if it's your, your headset or um, if you mm. to jiggle that and see if that helps. Yeah, thanks, Jackie. I am going to take Valeria's advice, I believe, that she gave Anne earlier and turn off my video for the time being. Let me see if I can do that in a relatively quick way here. <laughs> All right, still hopefully that improves some. Okay. <laughs> All right, is this better for folks? Yes, it is. Yeah. Oh, good. All right, well, hopefully not too much was lost of what I was sharing before. I'll try to recap some of that as we look specifically at the data collected from NWNW421, our fancy name for uh, the downstream most site that we monitor on Northwest Branch main stem. So as I was saying before, we have IBI scores or index of biotic integrity scores that we're looking at for the fish community and the benthic macroinvertebrate community. And they're both plotted here. They're plotted in terms of percentages so that they're comparable. And you can see on the y-axis here, we have from zero to 100%, where 100% would be the best of the best reference condition and everything else um, is based upon that with these IBIs. The benthic macroinvertebrate community, those aquatic insects are gonna be plotted here in, let's see, dare I try the laser pointer? Okay, <laughs> plotted here in gray squares. Our fish community is plotted here with black circles. So you can see we have a pretty complete data set from 2004 to 2020, save a little gap with one um, data point for fish where in 2010, um, the crews were unable to sample due to some WSSC work that was happening along the site. So this is probably a good place for me to point out and say that this is gonna be a provisional analysis. These data should be um, treated as provisional um, in that we just um, analyzed some of the 2020 data. We don't even have all the lab samples processed, but we did what we could to get the most um, up-to-date and recent data here for you all tonight. So with that in mind, you're going to see that our two biological communities are changing over time, and they're responding to their environment in different ways. Our fish community up here is rated fair overall. So an average of all these points sits at right here in this yellow band. And you can see how from year to year, it basically straddles between a fair and good stream condition. Um, the benthic macroinvertebrate community down here in gray is a little bit more volatile. Um, that's not atypical for benthic macroinvertebrate data, particularly down in main stem in these large stream system and catchment areas. It tends to be noisier overall, but we're seeing, again, a tendency to stick around fair. When you average all those points together, it sits in fair, but rather than straddling into good territory at any point, it will occasionally dip into poor. So when we consider both of those communities together, 
that combined index of biotic integrity I mentioned or the average stream condition score does put Northwest Branch, that portion of the main stem and kind of that representation of Northwest Branch overall in fair territory. Now, if you're anything like me, I couldn't really ignore the dips, uh, particularly um, when we put our 2020 data in for bugs and I was looking forward to seeing something up in fair because the fish community stayed good and mm, it wasn't quite what I was expected. So there's a limitation to how much we can really infer for a drainage area so large. Again, we're talking 29 square miles, lots of tributaries. You're gonna hear about some of the tributaries in the upstream conditions. Um, and then there's a lot happening with the main stem. You saw in 2010, a disruption at the site itself due to some WSSC work on the sanitary sewer lines. Something of that nature happened in 2005 as well. Uh, WSSC came in and did an asset uh, protection repair. They were working to prevent any leaks and damage to their pipes. They reinforced to the surrounding area and they in turn dramatically changed the nature of the stream right around where our biological monitoring site is. We do see um, the bio biology kind of come back from there, but the other divots, it seems like there may be something going on that's both weather related and indicative of other things going on in the watershed that may be a little harder to pinpoint. But for example, 2008 was a drought year in much of Maryland. Um, when drought conditions happen in the summer of one year, they're usually seen in the benthic macroinvertebrate community in the spring. So our 2009 bugs may have felt that a little bit. Uh, likewise, in 2017, there was also some um, uh, more unusual weather conditions. The sampling occurred after a pretty extended dry period, and it was also unseasonably warm. Those factors can also influence the biological community, especially the benthic macroinvertebrate community, um, and especially in an area that's already stressed from other things. So again, kind of a diagnosis of some of these symptoms that we're seeing. As for 2020, to be determined. Um, we haven't finished all of our data analysis for 2020, so we'll be looking at other places, not only in Northwest Branch, but around the county to see if there's kind of county-wide trends. Um, and then we'll continue to kind of investigate and look into and come back to the station from year to year to determine the rest. So the takeaways um, from this to keep in mind is that the community scores do increase following drops and that's encouraging. That is demonstrating some level of resiliency. We do see an overall upward trend across all years and across both biological communities and within the fish community. And one reason why it tends to straddle fair and even cross into good and sometimes stay indicative of good water quality is it has conditions that are supporting a pollutant intolerant fish. So we have a sensitive fish species, the Northern hog sucker pictured there, um, that relies very heavily on invertebrates, macroinvertebrates in particular as its diet. And there's sufficient food and sufficient habitat and sufficient water quality to keep them coming back or staying put year after year after year. Um, but as I mentioned, there are gonna be limitations. There's definite indications that there's stress. We're aware of a lot of different work happening in the watershed, some problems in the watershed. You'll hear about um, some solutions that Parks is working on next. There may be limitations to the habitat availability and water quality. So we can't reasonably expect that we're gonna hit excellent, especially in such a large downstream portion. Um, and there's just a lot going on. So we kind of have to look elsewhere in the watershed for some sources and solutions for them. And with that, I will turn it over to Erin. Thanks so much, Rachel. Um, yep, so we're bringing it up in the watershed a little bit, and I'm now going to talk about a project that's in a small tributary to Northwest Branch. We're currently in the design and permitting phases of a stream restoration project for this portion that you see of Glen Allen Tributary, which is outlined in yellow. 
It's located in the northwestern area of Wheaton Regional Park. Um, for reference, the intersection you see on the left of two large roads is Georgia Avenue and Randolph Road. The road that runs across the top of your screen is Glen Allen Avenue. Um, there's Brookside Gardens up on the top right and Pine Lake in the bottom left, I mean on the bottom right. Um, and as an aside, this was one of four stream restoration projects for which parks took over the design and the permitting and implementation from Montgomery County DEP. However, the projects will all still contribute impervious removal credits to Montgomery County DEP's MS4 permit that Rachel spoke about earlier, how parks has a permit and the county has a separate permit. Um, of the other three projects, two of them are Grosner and Stony Brook which are both tributaries to Rock Creek. Grosner is currently wrapping up construction while Stony Brook is about to get started. And the remaining of the four projects is called Clear Spring Manor and it's up in the Magruder Branch watershed and that one's also under design. So when the county's program shifted gears and parks took over this project, uh, the project has remained prioritized due to some severe erosion threatening private property. Um, but we also have identified a loss of habitat in this reach, which is almost exclusively piped upstream of the project area, meaning it's pretty much coming straight out of the storm drain system to be then daylighted at the beginning of the project. So the stream has a drainage area of about 127 acres, of which 42 acres are untreated impervious surfaces. So we're looking at about a third impervious surfaces draining to this tributary. Um, those conditions have definitely contributed to the stream degradation that we're seeing on site. Project goals are going to include reducing bank erosion, reducing bed degradation, reducing the entrenchment of the stream to help reconnect the stream with the floodplain wherever that is feasible, and also habitat creation, both in the stream as well as on the floodplain, while also preserving the riparian resources that do exist out there today. Um, and in looking at these photos, um, these are some existing conditions photos that you're looking at right now. Um, the top two are near the upstream end of the reach and the bottom two are closer to the downstream end. Um, besides the piles of shopping carts, which are always numerous out there, you can also see the evidence in the photos of the erosion of the over widened stream, the down cut stream bed, the lack of the riffles and the pools, and the presence of the non-native invasive plant species on the banks. So in contrast, the photos you're looking at now highlight the type of work that parks will be implementing at the Glen Allen tributary site. So these specific photos came from a recent stream restoration project that we completed in Sligo Creek. Uh, these are pretty commonly used techniques for stream restoration and they're built according to our park specific details. The photo on the left is looking upstream and the photo on the right is looking downstream, um, just to give you a little bit of sense of what you're looking at there. So some of the techniques we see here are a cross vein, which is an imbricated rock structure shaped like the letter U that focuses the stream energy into the center of the channel to help protect the banks. It also provides grade control, which is protection against the stream down cutting and creates really deep scour pools. Um, so leading up to the cross veins, so in the photo in the left, you're looking at kind of far in the background of the photo. In the photo in the right, you're looking at the foreground, are riffle grade controls. And those are constructed riffles that we build to help control the stream bed elevation while also providing both flow diversity in both depth and speed and also riffle habitat. Um, in combination, these structures can help to achieve both the flow and depth diversity that I talked about while also stabilizing the stream bed and banks. Um, so the purpose of providing this stability to the stream system is that it primarily helps to decrease the loss of stream bank sediment to downstream, which is a major pollutant and especially in the Chesapeake Bay watershed. Um, something that's not pictured here, but is also another critical element of our um, park stream restoration philosophy is incorporating wood back into the channel. 
So we do this primarily in the form of root wads, which are large root balls of trees that are turned sideways and installed into the stream bank in pools. They provide excellent cover for fish. And also we also incorporate woody material into the riffles whenever we can. Um, so we aren't just ending up with a fully rocked channel. Um, another notable item I'd like to point out that you can notice in these photos are the trees that you see adjacent to this just completed stream restoration work. Um, the lighter colored vertical planks that you see on the trees are called tree planking. And it's essentially just a technique that's used during construction. So those are removed when the contractor demobilizes or leaves the construction site. And they protect the tree trunks from getting scarred um, by equipment rubbing up against them or a swinging arm of an excavator during construction. Um, saving and protecting these trees during a stream restoration project is a really big priority for parks. You can see that we were able to save trees that were even directly along the stream banks. Um, and by keeping that riparian buffer intact, um, it's so important for an ecosystem as a whole. Um, if we can, can, can look at our systems as headwaters and riparian areas, as well as the actual streams, and that any project that we're working on to restore one element of those needs to work in concert and preserve the others in order to be truly successful. So I'll be talking a little bit more about some techniques we use in those other areas later in the presentation. But for right now, I'll hand it back to Rachel and she can discuss the results of their monitoring within Glen Ellen Tributary. All right, thanks, Erin. So we collected data on the existing conditions of the Glen Allen tributary using the same protocols as all of our other biological monitoring sites, including the one I presented earlier tonight. So in addition to looking at the site within the planned area of restoration, so that was the area along Glen Allen Road here that Aaron was describing, we also took a look at a location downstream for comparison. And this location is close to Brookside Nature Center, um, with the thought being that this could help inform what the water quality is downstream in order to infer what the upstream portion of the stream could look like. So both of these sites, NWGT 101, our project station, and its downstream comparison 201, were visited in the spring and the summer and the benthic macroinvertebrate samples were collected the very same day. And because we're looking at a significantly smaller drainage area and we know a lot about this particular stream reach at the surface and what Erin described to you, I thought it would be interesting to take a deeper dive into the benthic macroinvertebrate community in particular. So we still have IBI scores to talk about. And what we saw for the two years of data that we had available for our test site or that 101, the within the pre-restoration stream area is a poor biological community, unfortunately. That's represented up here in the top figure. The bottom set of rings is our control or our downstream comparison station. Um, we had a few more data points to look at, so a few more rings. Um, it's by no means a stellar example. It's not a reference stream or anything of the sort, but it's another reach within the stream, same system that is protected very well with its placement adjacent to Brookside Nature Center. So it's got a fairly intact um, riparian area, although it has its challenges as well. And those challenges are reflected a bit in the biological communities. So we see in 2004 and 2009, unfortunately, a poor benthic IBI score. But in 2011 and 2020, it does cross into fair territory. And part of the reason that that may be has to do with the underlying structure of the benthic macroinvertebrate community. So these colored wedges are representing the community composition. You can think of them like a little food web in which groups of organisms have certain jobs and they're working together to break down and process organic matter. So in a balanced community, um, we'd see a mix of roles effectively. 
about a third or so would be purple and green together. You'd have another third that would be orange or our shredder organisms, ones that are taking leaf material and coarse uh, debris and breaking it down into smaller particles. And then the remaining third being predators and scrapers, organisms that are going in and feeding on the paraphyton and the diatomaceous algae on the rock substrates. But we clearly don't have anything that fits that description in either our pre-restoration channel or the downstream control. Um, you can see what's not noticeably absent. Um, shredders are barely present in the 2020 uh, sample for our pre-restoration area. There's no um, benthic macroinvertebrate predators. So there may be other predatory animals that are eating the benthic macroinvertebrates, but not predatory benthic macroinvertebrates. So I hope that distinction makes sense. Um, below uh, in the Northwest branch 201 site or our downstream comparison site, you see a little bit more variety. So again, by no means perfect, um, but we are seeing shredders and some um, predatory benthic macroinvertebrates. The other thing that's particularly notable about shredders beyond their specialized ecological function is that many of the taxa that make up the shredder community are also among the most sensitive to water quality pollution and impairment. So things like mayflies and stoneflies. You would not find that Terranarsis here, unfortunately. So it's a bit of a double whammy if they don't have the food resources they need and there are other pollutants or water quality impairments that are knocking them out. Other key differences we see between the pre-restoration site upstream and this downstream uh, restoration site also is just the total number of taxa. There are not very many type, different types of organisms. 2005, there were just four. There were just six in 2020. Um, whereas downstream in 2020, we see nine taxa. So there's a little bit more diversity. And those are gonna be some of the factors that are driving um, the overall ratings of poor or fair, depending on what location you're in. The other thing kind of of note is that although um, the biology isn't an implicit project design goal, we're hoping that it's kind of gonna ride the coattails of some of the improvements that Erin was describing. So what we could see hopefully is if there's improvements to the stormwater control and the stream channel upstream, that might allow for a shift in the community structure, both within the site and downstream. It's kind of a reciprocal relationship. You'd expect improvements upstream to help downstream, but uh, connectivity down to the downstream location could allow for some of those organisms to move in and stay in. And if that's the case, we might happen to see some different organisms that might be able to use it. Um, one that would be particularly exciting would be um, a species of crayfish that's been identified as a state uh, species of greatest conservation need. We see it downstream at NWGT201. They're fairly mobile as far as a benthic macro goes. It would be awesome to see them move up into the restored channel. So we'll continue our post restoration monitoring after everything is stabilized and we'll kind of keep an eye on it and see what happens. Um, so likewise with the fish um, and amphibian and reptile communities or vertebrate communities, we saw a similar story. We see these communities being reflective of a small and struggling stream within the pre-restoration area or the headwaters of Glen Allen tributary. Um, we did find three species of fish present, all of which are known as pioneer species that are well adapted and tolerant to highly variable conditions. Um, so you have your black nosed dace are kind of your quintessential minnow. Um, they're the most common species of fish that we see throughout Montgomery County. Those are there along with some others that can do and tolerate um, very fluctuating environmental conditions. Um, likewise, we see our amphibian community represented by generalist species as well, American bullfrog and green frog taking advantage of the habitat that is there. Uh, one bright spot, though, in particular, is that there's at least one resident box turtle that has the headwaters within its territory, 
and is relying on the stream habitat for food, water, and dispersal as well. And box turtles have a very particular home range um, that they stay within. So because we're seeing box turtles at least twice that we were there in 2020, that their needs are being met. And we hope that with um, the other changes made, that they'll be able to utilize that stream corridor to a fuller potential. So with the stream restoration items planned as Aaron described, we do have some hope that there will be improvements to the habitat connectivity from downstream to upstream, as I mentioned. So something that is tolerant and mobile, um, but maybe a little less tolerant and could make use of stable riffles like the fan hill darter might be able to make its way in stream. Um, and then by having stable and um, clear riffles, maybe they'll stick around with an increase in habitat availability. And as I mentioned, that kind of inverse relationship whereby improving upstream conditions, we're hopeful that downstream conditions could also um, be improved and set the stream reach up for future success. And as I mentioned for our biological monitoring, we do collect supplemental data to tell a more complete picture of what's going on and influencing the biological community. And our assessment echoed what Aaron um, and found and was found as part of the overall stream restoration evaluation and design priorities. There were very obvious habitat impairments, very shallow and low base flow. Um, as Aaron mentioned, a kind of lack of fish cover, um, a lack of prime invertebrate habitat, including ripple habitat, the stream bottom and banks are very unstable, a lot of sediment being transported, deposited and moved around, and extensive non-native and invasive riparian plants that have shallow root systems that aren't going to be really contributing to any, to very much, I should say, bank um, stability. We also, took a look at the physical chemistry and there were a couple um, little flags that appeared. One is that we look at dissolved oxygen. That's essentially saturated oxygen that's available for the aquatic organisms to use. And we expect at most stations for it to be one around 100% or even exceed 100%. So you could get a super saturation condition. And in summer, it was down at half that, at about 48% within the pre-restoration restoration reach. So warm temperatures can contribute to that, a lack of turbulence, a lack of those riffle habitats may have something to do with that. So we would look to see um, if there's any change in that as we continue monitoring, um, because that is the sort of environmental condition that would cause prolonged stress and impairment to a biological community. We also saw higher than desirable conductivity values in the spring. So conductivity is a surrogate for salt concentrations. And you'd expect in our Montgomery County streams at somewhere around 300. And while we did see that in the summer in the pre-restoration site, and we saw it in the spring and summer in our downstream control or comparison site, it was over double that in the spring at the pre-restoration site. So there is influences of road salt or other pollutants that seemed to come into the system during the spring. And so I'll turn it back over to Aaron to describe a little bit more about how stream restoration maybe can act as a band-aid or a fix in some ways, but it's not the only approach that we're taking in order to help repair some of our impaired or sick stream systems. Erin? Yeah, so just to kind of build on exactly what Rachel was just saying there that um, although parks always values and has improved biological function in mind when we do a stream restoration project, we do recognize the limitations on the effect we can have on a single site since so much of stream biology is related to what's coming out of the watershed and flowing into our streams. Uh, science has found that in order for restoration to be successful on a whole watershed scale, 
it must target the degraded headwaters and subwatersheds within the larger watersheds. So being a stream valley park system, um, we are very uniquely and most commonly the recipient of stormwater in a form that's most of the time out of our control. But we do target headwaters and subwatersheds when they are in our purview. I'm sure most of you are familiar with a lot of the traditional stormwater LID and ESD um, techniques such as bioretentions and rain gardens, or if you're not, we can come back and do a whole hour presentation on all of that. Um, but for right now, I'm going to skip talking about those. And instead, I'm going to go into a detailed discussion of highlighting a couple BMPs that we implement on parkland that are part of this treatment train that fit well into parks wheelhouse as far as what land we can control and what difference we can make on in that land in those areas. So the first one I'll discuss is our Riparian Enhancements Program, where we convert spaces that are current, generally mowed, uh, maintained turf grass back into natural areas with native plants. So as you can glean from the name of the program, we prioritize locations within the riparian buffer for this work. Um, they often occur along our stream valley trail systems. We don't cut down native trees in order to build these, but we find existing open areas and work around existing tree roots where we do see opportunities. So in the past, similar projects have sometimes also been called microtopography or floodplain depressions based on exactly how they're graded or where they're located, but we're all, all of those terms technically are generally talking about the same thing. Um, these areas are graded as depressions to capture runoff, and sometimes it's done kind of within one depressional area or one cell. Other times we grade multiple cells that might be connected by log berms to control the flow in between them and the flow path. Um, within each cell, we kind of add microtopography, or if you think of it as kind of hummocks or rough, roughness to pro provide some depth and habitat diversity. Um, these cells can serve to capture water on the floodplain, they promote infiltration, they develop riparian habitat, and they can extend some flow paths. Um, we incorporate large woody debris into them for habitat. Um, when we're finished, we seed them with our parks riparian native seed mix, and we plant them heavily with native herbaceous species um, when possible, and most of the time we try to use plants from our own Pope Farm Nursery. Um, and when appropriate, we'll also incorporate native tree and shrub species as well. So the photos you're looking at now are from these sites along Sligo Creek Trail, um, pretty soon after construction with this treatment. We have locations of this treatment planned along the Glen Allen Tributary Stream Restoration Project as well, both in existing open areas that we've identified and also in some of the areas that currently have uh, stands of non-native invasive plant material like the bamboo stand. So the next technique that I'll talk about, another park's best management practice or BMP, is our sustainable outfall stabilization program. So as a Stream Valley Park system, we're the recipient of much runoff from upland development, as I've been talking about. Um, some of it is our own, but a lot of it is out of our control. It's from the county and other entities. And so over decades, this has resulted in countless severely eroded outfalls onto parkland. Sometimes we're able to work with other agencies to help get them fixed, and Jackie will be talking a little bit about that later in the presentation. Um, but other times, it falls on parks to correct the damage. And we feel very strongly that the old school methods of concrete or even just dumping riprap are really no longer the best tools we have to fix these program to fix these problems for the long term in a manner that's sustainable and will work with the surrounding environment. Um, plus, if you look at the picture on the top left, which is a before picture, you can see a completely failing concrete outfall right there. Um, so we tend to use a series of cascades, which are kind of steep rock structures or log drops, and then pools in sequence, or we'll use riffles, which are like a cascade, but a little bit flatter, and pools in sequence of like riffle pool, riffle pool, um, in order to rebuild the outfall. 
So the steps and the cascades and the riffles into the pools allow for proper energy, energy dissipation. They provide a stable drop for the water to transition from the outfall down into the floodplain. And the pools also provide opportunities for infiltration and for plant uptake. Um, whenever possible, we utilize materials that are already on site. If there was riprap that was dumped previously in that ravine, um, we'll reuse the old riprap. We'll find logs from already dead downed trees kind of in the surrounding area that we'll use to build log drops. Um, and we'll import materials only if they're needed to ensure stability or if there's nothing available on site. Um, we also work within the existing ravines pretty much exclusively, definitely as much as possible to minimize tree losses. Um, in many cases, these gullies are so eroded that there's sufficient space to provide plenty of space for construction access and work. Um, for example, the pictures you're looking at on the far right is a picture looking downstream and we did no clearing on this site. There was an existing gully and the trees you see are the ones that were on the edge and we filled in um, the gully with our work. So we also follow up with our riparian seed mix and the native trees and shrubs here as well. And there's two locations along the Glen Allen tributary that we'll be addressing outfalls. One is coming out of Glenmont Circle and another is at the very end of our project parallel to Glen Allen Road. So what you see now is a map of the Northwest Branch watershed. I'm sure all of you are very familiar with that shape. Um, and these are the locations where we're installing the techniques that I've just spoken about now, the riparian enhancements and the sustainable outfall stabilizations this coming winter in the watershed. So essentially right about now um, and coming into early spring. So the map in the upper left is the entire watershed and that red line, the red horizontal line indicates the split where the lower larger map is split. Um, and the yellow stars each represent a project coming soon. Um, the green outlines, which are a little bit hard to see, um, but are our parkland boundaries are essentially, you know, the land that we can control um, within these areas. And then this is a map of looking at a little bit of a bigger picture of the environmental work on parkland within Northwest Branch. And this, in, this represents environmental best management practices that have been constructed and are active and, and planned within the Northwest Branch watershed over about the past 10 years or the decade. So the blue dots represent projects that we've completed the yellow ones are active projects, either in design or construction, and the red dots are where a potential project has been identified. Um, the biggest difference, other than the time frame between this map and the last one you were looking at, are that um, the last map we're just showing projects that that Parks is actually paying for out of our capital improvements program. However, this map also represents. Um, projects which we've partnered with outside agencies on to have beneficial work done on parkland. And to give you some more specifics about how we work and collaborate with our partners on these projects, I'm going to pass the mic over to Jackie. All right, thank you, Erin, and good evening, all. As Erin mentioned, my name is Jackie. I work in Montgomery Parks in the resource analysis section, which Rachel, Doug, and myself are all members of. The resource analysis section is the aquatic resource focus group within Montgomery Parks. Within this section, we have designated staff such as myself and Doug Stevens, who's also here with us this evening that provide environmental review for any project that will have impacts to parkland. We do this through the concept review process and through our park construction permit. And without getting too into the weeds on this process, I do wanna provide a little bit of context to how we are addressing the other elements to the treatment train that Aaron talked about and relating that to these projects and improvements in the Northwest Branch watershed, watershed that stem from this process. So the concept review process is designed for early coordination with Montgomery Parks for projects proposed by external public and private entities that will directly impact parkland. And parkland makes up approximately 11% of Montgomery County. So it's a, it's a large area. And the projects that impact parkland range from very large infrastructure and development projects 
down to the maintenance and repair of a single outfall or culvert. All the projects that run that gamut need to go through this review process. The concept review process evaluates whether projects proposed on parkland align with Montgomery County Park's mission and values. And being a stream valley park system, aquatic resource impacts and stormwater management are always of high consideration during this review process, which is in part why this function operates out of our section that um, is focused on our aquatic resources. So after the concept review process is complete, really once a project has reached a certain design level that meets park standards, Parks continues to review the project as the design advances through the park construction permit. Um, and even once we give them that, you know, the, the permit, we continue to be involved in these projects through construction until project completion. So hopefully that overview provides some insight into how Parks operates as far as our role in the environmental review of the construction and development you see going on in the county in and around Parkland. Um, so with that, I'll move on to discuss some of these projects that are within the Northwest Branch Watershed that we partner with these external agencies on. Um, and these projects are in various stages of review and some of them are, are recently completed projects as well. So we work with um, State Highway Administration throughout the county um, on various projects. Here are three examples of recent and upcoming projects within the Northwest Branch Watershed. So starting from the top there, we have Managed Lane Study. For those of you who may not be familiar, the Managed Lane Study is a 48 mile bi-county project um, that's looking at the possibility of adding express lanes to the beltway and a portion of I-270. Parks is very involved in the federal NEPA process for this project due to the amount of parkland adjacent to the highway. One aspect of this project is the replacement of the bridge over Northwest Branch, which is that um, bottom map that you see there. Parks is working with SHA to understand, you know, the possible design elements to that bridge construction. Um, we want to really want to limit the impacts to parkland here and to the stream and identify appropriate parkland mitigation as needed. On the opposite end of the spectrum there, on a much smaller scale, Parks is coordinating with SHA on the addition of a bioretention at Burnt Mills East Special Park, which is that top right image, um, to treat runoff from the parking lot. This is in conjunction with an SHA sidewalk improvement near Lockwood Drive. And the last project that I wanna mention that we're working with SHA on currently in Northwest Branch Watershed is also related to the managed lane study. SHA uh, as part of that potential I-495 widening will be required to complete stream and wetland mitigation. And Parks is coordinating with SHA at four different locations for this work. Uh, the location in that bottom right map there is calling out the Rolling Stone tributary just downstream of Bonifant Road. And this reach is fairly incised. It's got unstable banks um, and it then transitions into a stream and wetland complex before rejoining with the main stem of Northwest Branch. So moving on from SHA, we also partner with Washington Suburban Sanitary Commission or WSSC on a variety of projects since a large amount of their sewer and water infrastructure is on parkland. A list of the common projects that we work with WSSC on are there on the left. And the photos on the right highlight a unique project we were able to complete with WSSC again at Burt Mills East Special Park right off 29, where there was a degraded outfall with failing concrete directly adjacent to the trailhead. SHA approached parks about fixing this outfall, but due to the sensitive nature of the area, we thought it would make more sense for SHA to work on that bioretention I mentioned. And we asked WSSC to fix this outfall since they were doing a lot of work in that area, which we'll talk about more in a minute. Underneath that failing concrete was a large sanitary sewer pipe. So it also made sense for that reason for WSSC to do this work. Um, and so the concrete was carefully removed. A more natural rock cascade was built into the existing bedrock, which you can see in those upper two images there. And it looks like the outfall blends much better into the surrounding area and provides an improved functionality as well. Uh, the next project I wanna mention that we're working with WSSC on is uh, the Rolling Stone tributary again. So I mentioned that SHA is working on um, potential mitigation for that managed lane study at the lower uh, downstream section of Rolling Stone tributary south of Bonifant Road. With WSSC, we're working on the reach north of Bonifant Road, um, which we're currently in preliminary design for a stream restoration there, focusing on stabilization and 
covering up some of the exposures that are in that reach. You can see in that picture there, a large manhole that's exposed. Um, and this project has been on parks radar for remediation for some time, but recently gained momentum with concerns being reported from adjacent residents in the area that have contacted parks through our customer service portal. So parks is planning to do some pre-restoration monitoring here in 2021 in hopes of moving this project forward in the near future. Uh, another WSSC, a large WSSC project, actually a few projects you can see highlighted on this map here in the left where those red lines indicate um, a lot of needed work occurred in and around the main stem of Northwest Branch over the last couple years um, between Route 29 and the Beltway. Uh, again, this was a lot of asset protection work um, and we got some, some good stream restoration in as part of that asset protection. WSSC had numerous large sewer pipes running along down that area that needed repair work. Uh, and you can see in the image on the top right where the stream is pumped down, where they're, where they're doing that work. And in the bottom left, uh, a view looking downstream at Northwest Branch following the, the construction of some riffle grade control and bank protection. On this slide, we have some more images of that main stem work. So um, as stewards of these important resources, we really do take seriously the need to protect natural resources while completing these essential infrastructure projects. A lot of the stuff Aaron talked about as far as tree protection go into to all of our projects. Um, all the stream work is completed in dry conditions, meaning that the stream is pumped down to work in the site to prevent that sediment from entering the stream and flowing downstream. The photo on the top left shows a system of five 12 inch pumps that were needed to pump down the stream. Um, it's a lot of water that needed to be moved uh, to, to pump around that main stem of Northwest Branch. And before the stream work even occurs, fish nets are installed at the top and bottom of the site. The fish are relocated from the site so that we're, we're rescuing as many fish as possible. So we're really trying to minimize our impacts there. The photo on the top right shows the access road for equipment, which is something that we always consider for these projects. We don't wanna impact our resources just trying to get equipment in and out of these sites. Uh, we always require 12 inches of mulch and wood matting for the access road that protects the roots of the trees and you know, reduces compaction of the soil. And a lot of this road for these projects was along the Northwest Branch Trail. And walking through here now, you wouldn't you know, think that, that that was a construction access road because the impacts were so minimal. And the final WSSC project I want to mention is another stream restoration and asset protection project that is in design for the Lamberton tributary that is directly upstream of the confluence with Northwest Branch. You can see in the map there in red, that red line is the, the area that we're looking to restore with WSSC. This project will remove previous bank stabilization features uh, that are failing and protect exposed pipes, remove abandoned infrastructure, and restore an outfall in the reach as well. Moving on from WSSC projects, another agency we work close, closely with is Montgomery County Department of Transportation. Uh, we're in continuous co coordination with DOT on outfall maintenance and repair. As Aaron mentioned, we're receiving a lot of these waters and a lot of it's coming from county and state roads. And so DOT um, manages a lot of these outfalls that outfall onto parkland. And the map here is showing uh, Northwest Branch watershed north of Route 29 and displays our four most recent outfall projects in the watershed. So from the top there, Pebble Beach Court outfall was completed early in 2020. Lamberton Drive and Lovejoy Street um, is an outfall that was completed just this recently in the past winter and will be planted this spring. And Loxford Terrace and Margate Road um, were two close outfalls that were completed in fall of 2020. And these projects are interesting. They're often identified by Montgomery County residents, again, reporting them through our, our uh, customer service reporting program. And Parks has a really big influence on the approach and design of these projects, as Aaron mentioned. It's especially important for us to have this involvement when we're working with an agency that's focus is really transportation infrastructure, specializes in that old school concrete and riprap approach to these outfalls. And it's great that they work so well with us. And we have folks like Aaron and Doug that lend their expertise to help design these outfalls with more than just stability in mind. So here are just some images of those recent outfall projects that I just mentioned. And Again, our goals are really to go beyond stability here. We're looking to reduce those stormwater velocities, increase stormwater treatment and reconnect channels with floodplain if possible. 
and replanting the area with native vegetation, all while minimizing impacts to the adjacent natural resources. In addition to working with larger public agencies and organizations on stormwater improvements, Parks works to implement stormwater best management practices wherever we can, including working with HOAs and other adjacent property owners where issues have been identified. So on this slide, I'm showing two out falls that flow into a tributary of Northwest Branch. These outfalls collect stormwater from an adjacent HOA, flow onto parkland and come down this steep slope that as you can see on this image to the left here, you know, create a fairly degraded and incised channel. Uh, the construction of Encore Drive was completed in 2019 and Finale Terrace on the left will be completed this year. And really these efforts are only possible due to the proactive approach the property owners take to remediate the conditions on their property and coordinate with parks to stabilize the downstream portions that are on parkland. And the last project I wanna mention is a project proposal from DOT to construct a side path along Norwood Road at Woodlawn Cultural Special Park um, at the top of the watershed as part of the Heritage Triangle Trail connection Clearly this project is a transportation infrastructure project, but again, Parks is always looking for different ways, um, always looking for ways in these projects to improve stormwater management. And we're working with DOT on this project to improve stormwater management adjacent to their new side path here. And with that, um, before handing things over to volunteer services to wrap up, I'll give Doug Stevens the floor to put in a quick plug for the Wheaton Regional Park Master Plan update. Great, thanks, Jackie. And I will caveat this with this is um, this is not my project, but we did want to bring up this um, this important work that we're doing um, for Wheaton Regional Park, which is obviously uh, within the Northwest Branch watershed. Um, and so I think probably everybody here is familiar with Wheaton Regional Park. Um, it's you know one of our most used regional parks that we have in our system, and it's a, it's a great amenity. Um, but the master plan, the current master plan for Wheaton Regional Park was created back in 1987. So that was a little, you know, that was a little while ago. Um, and a lot of those initiatives have been, you know, incorporated into the park over the years. And so it is time to, you know, kind of redo that master plan, um, assess what we have, assess our needs for the future, and assess what, um, you know, what the community values at Wheaton and what they would like to see um, at Wheaton in the future. So we are just... Um, just beginning this process. We've had a couple of public meetings so far, um, but we are still very much in the early stages and looking for you know, your input on, on our new master plan. So there's a couple of ways that you guys can do that. I do have a link there, um, master plan update, but if you just Google Wheaton Park master plan update, that'll take you to the right place. Um, it, once you do that, you can get to what we call our open town hall forum. Basically it's like an online, um, way to submit comments and ideas for the master plan. And there's also an interactive map there. And then finally, you can also just email our project manager um, for the master plan update, which is Chuck Kynes. And I put his email right there on the screen. So go ahead and screenshot that or copy that down. Um, anyhow, so again, please reach out um, if you, you know, care about the future of Wheaton Regional Park and you know, what amenities um, you, you would like to see there in the future. Thanks. All right. All right. So to bring us home is going to be Valeria to talk about the other ways in which you can very hands-on get involved in Northwest Branch, some of which might be familiar and some might be new. So take it away. All right. I'll try to keep this brief. Um, so my name is Valeria and I am the um, community or uh, park cleanup coordinator um, in the volunteer services office. So I just started um, about a month ago. <laughs> so I'm very new. Um, but I'm very excited and I, um, I just want to share with you what are some ways that you can get involved um, and uh, some of the programs that are run by our office. Um, we have three main programs that we run. So trail volunteering that um, is run by uh, Jim Corcoran. Um, so uh, usually he runs a few um, public trail work days, but um, they're currently on hold obviously due to COVID. Um, but currently he's, um, he's working with a couple of organized groups, generally scouts um, and any um, small groups that contact him. Um, so um, if you're interested in trail work um, or a trail rangers um, program, 
uh, con you can contact Jim. Uh, Weed Warriors, you might have heard of, um, if, if some of you might be Weed Warriors already, um, that are continuing to work independently. Um, public Weed Warrior workdays are still on hold. Um, but uh, Corinne Stevens, who's in charge of uh, Weed Warriors, um, is accepting new um, applications to become certified. So um, you can still apply and she can get you started with some e-learning. Um, so, um, so feel free to check that out. And then the third big one is uh, Park Cleanups, which is me. So we are um, currently planning uh, some public park cleanups um, and um, I'm very interested in kind of um, engaging more with the neighbors of Northwest Branch for this. Um, but um, so that's why I'm, I'm kind of thinking of, of um, creating a, a park cleanup leader opportunity uh, for anyone who might be interested. And I'll talk more about that um, next. So um, we try to gather some highlights for you guys. Um, what we've been working on um, currently is um, trying to divide our, our data by watershed um, because in the past it was kind of, it's, it's been kind of tricky with our database. Um, so our data is a little bit different, um, but um, our goal, my goal at least is to um, get it sorted so that we can kind of have um, have da more data based on watershed because what we usually do is just total everything for the whole county, and um, that gets you know that gets submitted to um, to our permits. So um, so for trails um, for Northwest Branch specifically, um, and this is since we started tracking in 2011, uh, you can see over a thousand volunteers and um, over 8,572 hours. So that's um, pretty significant. Um, and then Weed Warriors, we have um, data from this past year um, where um, we had 269 hours. And then in, in our tributaries, um, we, we have um, over 2,000 um, volunteer hours, which is pretty good. Um, so, and, and should, it should be better this year. <laughs> we can go next. Okay. Um, so these are some cleanup highlights. Um, that I was able to get for Northwest Branch. So we've had over 200 cleanups and um, 3,939 service hours since 2011. Um, so um, we've collected a lot of trash. You can see lots of trash and usually not as much recycling, but uh, 667 bags, that's still a lot. Um, and then loose trash is anything that's bigger than a trash. Um, what would fit in a trash bag. So we do an estimate for those things, things like shopping carts, tires. Um, so um, like I mentioned before, um, and that's what, what you can see in the graphs at the bottom, um, the bottom just shows our totals for, for the whole county of what we get um, every year. So you can see the, the numbers by fiscal year um, and obviously 2020 is the lowest because we didn't, we, we weren't very active last year. Um, but it's important to know that all of this, uh, all of this data gets, gets, um, gathered and, and we, uh, depend on it for, to fund future programs and projects. Um, so, um, that's part of, that's a big, uh, reason why, why we like to track this data. So if any, if anyone has, uh, organized a cleanup before, um, you might, um, you might have gotten that uh, through Henry. Um, all right, we can go next. Okay, so um, so this is a new uh, program that I'm working on, and uh, basically, I uh, what I want to do is um, get um, anyone who's interested to apply, um, and um, I do want to start with the neighbors of Northwest Branch, just because uh, you all are the most um, engaged community members currently. Um, and then hopefully um, once, once uh, we get it launched, um, we can uh, open it up to anyone or build from it. Um, so um, so the, the big um, difference with this um, program is that we can do a lot of the coordination um, and we can recruit uh, members from the community so that can help engage um, people outside of, of the neighbors of Northwest Branch. Um, so 
we can engage students, we can engage other organizations. Um, and um, another goal is also to kind of um, improve our communication. Um, so um, when, when I do get requests for cleanups, um, I kind of have a better sense of where, where cleanups are needed. So, um, so that's, uh, this is kind of more um, of my draft of what I'm thinking for the program. I'm thinking it should, it could be a seasonal thing, but you know, people can, um, can continue as long as they, they would like to. Um, and, um, and you can get credit for doing scouting for cleanups and uh, well, volunteer hours that will um, that will get um, logged. Um, and um, then uh, once, once uh, we've you know, gone through the whole uh, onboarding process, um, we, can, we can schedule cleanup days for the community that work for you. So, um, and then we can also uh, choose lo the locations that are most needed. So um, that, uh, that, that way we kind of hit hit where, where the trash is and we have somebody who kind of knows how to, um, how to access that area. Um, so, um, and again, like I said, we would, we would handle all the recruitment coordination. Um, we would provide the cleanup supplies. Um, and at the end, um, all we, we, we would ask is um, the cleanup results. All right. All right. So. <laughs> So thank you so much, Valeria. Um, thank you, everyone, uh, especially for hanging in there. I do see that we're well beyond uh, the 8.30 time frame that we um, advertised. So for those of you that stuck in, thank you. Uh, thank you again for and hosting us. We certainly want to thank all our various team members. Biological monitoring in particular is not a one-person job, um, nor any of these improvement projects that we talked about and shared with you tonight. Um, so thank you again for your time and attention and a big thank you from some of the faces in Northwest Branch here. You know, thank you for lending um, a helping hand to our streams and your aquatic neighbors. Um, so in terms of follow-up questions, I see the chat has been blinking. Uh, so there's some things that we'll need to address. Um, what we will do is um, coordinate with Anne here on what we can um, get in maybe the next 10 minutes, if that works for my co-presenters and Anne, um, and anyone that wants to stick around, by all means. Um, and if not, uh, we'll disseminate the information to Anne from the chat that she can share her with the listserv. And you're also welcome to contact me or especially Valeria as our new ambassador to our watershed groups. And you'll find our email addresses there. Uh, we've also provided a copy of the presentation to Anne. So if you want to access some of those hyperlinks, some of those email addresses, they're available to you as well. So thank you very much. And Anne, you let us yeah, know how well, you want to take the, us home. <laughs> on behalf of the Neighbors of the Northwest Branch, gee, thank you. This has been really marvelous. Um, huge amount of information, uh, which I think is um, likely... Uh, it needs a bit of di digesting, uh, <laughs> but I got to hand it to you all. You, you're really covering um, everything. Um, and I'm seeing from some people that, I, that really know what's what, that uh, they agree. It was a wonderful presentation. <laughs> Um, now, as to questions, we have um, our program usually goes to nine o'clock. So, um, so if everyone would like to, um, let's see, how can we do this? Um, I think probably the chat is still the best way because I can't see everybody and Rachel can't see everybody either for raising your hands. So, um, uh, Anne, can I um, ask for a huge favor? <laughs> so um, I have to jump off, but I was, I did want to send the link out to um, the, um, the opportunity that I was talking about. But um, I do wanna let you know that it's a closed link right now. So um, you can share it, but only with you know, people who you think would be you know, good candidates. Um, I'll post it right now. Um, so um, you, can, you can check it out there. Thank you. Um, well, if you really don't want it shared yet, then maybe we shouldn't 
Oh, yeah. oh. We can um, wait until it's okay. It's fine. Um, just I guess when you when you do apply, just mention that you're with neighbors of North Northwest Branch. That would be helpful. Okay. Sorry. Thank you. Thank you. It's great meeting you. <laughs> Same. All right. Yeah, thanks, for you. <laughs> Thank you. All right. So with our remaining 10 questions, if you don't mind, Anne, I will take the liberty of scrolling through. I have seen some of the feedback now about the poor audio in the beginning. So again, my apologies uh, for that. We did yeah. have a question come through uh, for what the cleanest waterway is in Montgomery County. Um, I'm happy to make mention of that. So we do see a general trend in stream conditions that are higher in biological integrity up county versus down county. So the closer that you get to the District of Columbia and the associated urban development that's there, we do seem to see some stream impairments. Um, one really good resource to check out is Montgomery County Department of Environmental Protection has a stream conditions map set up. So you have a visual way that you can see what's green and what even might be blue in some of these small watersheds. And then you can interact with that map and dive a little deeper and take the biologist reins into your own hands. Let's see what else we have in the chat. Scrolling, scrolling. Um, we had a question of why did parks take over the projects um, that Aaron mentioned from the county? Aaron, did you want to highlight um, that again? Rachel, I'm happy to. What you probably have not been able to scroll down and see is that Doug was doing an excellent job answering most of these questions in the chat down below. Teamwork so, makes the dream work. <laughs> um, <laughs> essentially, DEP was reassessing their priorities and there was a risk that the projects might not happen in parks, um, you know, as the landowners felt pretty strongly that they needed to happen. So we were able to take them over to make sure that they still were able to happen. Um, and I'm linking in the chat that um, stream conditions map you just referenced, Rachel, yeah. I'm about to uh, press send now, so. Wonderful. All right, so we had that. We had um, some other questions about habitats and healthy versus impaired areas that maybe Doug hit. Um, if he didn't, I will just reiterate. So one question was about riffle habitat. Uh, so that's really desirable habitat within a stream. It's the areas in which there's cobble and rock present and the water it bas basically ripples over top of it. Um, and there's a lot of turbulence there where the dissolved oxygen can get very high. There's a lot of interstitial spaces within the rocks and the substrate for places for animals to hide and have habitat and that sort of thing. So we do see in Montgomery County, we have riffle run prevalent streams. So in our reference streams, what we would expect to have in undeveloped or kind of reference conditions are a series of ripple riffles and runs with some shallow pool and glide areas as well, but kind of a ripple, or excuse me, riffle run, riffle run uh, series down a stream reach. Um, to that same end, there was a question about um, if it's easier to make progress in compromised areas or healthy areas. Um, and I welcome my co-presenters to chime in here. I would say in my opinion and that it's a lot easier to protect and maintain an area than it is to go back in and fix and try to engineer a solution. Whereas preventative can be kind of the best, prevention can be kind of the best medicine. Um, Aaron, any yes, thoughts I, as the engineer? <laughs> I totally agree. If we have a project that comes to us and we go out and in combination with our initial engineering assessments and looking at park planning and stewardship's biological assessments, if we look and find that we have a good, healthy, stable system, then we do not move forward with that project at that time. Um, we definitely there, as much as we try to protect both during construction and long-term the resources when we go in, um, someone else from parks likes to say, it takes some eggs to make an omelet. You gotta break some eggs to make an omelet. And so there are definitely impacts of having construction equipment 
in a ecosystem in a in a normally you know untouched ecosystem so we really only want to go in if if we do see a degraded system that we feel we can help lift up um, if we feel like we have a system that is either already in excellent condition or even trending toward fixing itself and better then we choose to stay away and wait and observe um, to see if the system's on its way to fixing itself. Thanks, Erin. And before um, I take you out of the hot seat, um, a question specific to Glen Allen tributary restoration was, um, does it include addressing the source of the problem in the upland portions of the drainage area? And I know you touched on that, but maybe you want to yes. reinforce that. Sure. So we, yes, um, it, it, the, pro the stream restoration project itself doesn't do any more than I talked about with the areas immediately around the stream that we can squeeze in some riparian enhancements and some outfalls. But if we really wanted to see this tributary make great strides in seeing those bibby and fibby numbers improve like Rachel was talking about, it would take having pairing treatment of a lot of that upstream impervious with the actual stream restoration work. And that 30% impervious number for the watershed is extremely, extremely high. Um, we've got, uh, there's excellent data out there, but essentially once you break 10% impervious, even with some stream rest, with some stormwater management controls, um, it's very, very difficult to not see impaired water quality downstream. So with 30% impervious, we would need to see the input of stormwater controls and, and have a little luck as well with those and having those be super, super effective because it, it is just a, a watershed that is already so far beyond even um, where we would expect to be on the brink of impaired. We're well beyond that. All right. Thank you, Erin. And I have been scrolling, 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 multitasking, and I see all the great input that both you and Doug shared in the chat. So that took care of the past well, questions. Well, you know, it it's, like. still, it's still really nice mm -hmm. to have you answer the questions because not everybody may have caught the answer in the in the chat. Although I see that we're down from 44 to 25 participants. <laughs> <Our time>. <laughs> <laughs> um, so some people didn't need to know the answers, I guess, to those questions. Um, uh, but uh, with reference to that, uh, as long as I've got the microphone here, um, with reference to the Glen Allen tributary, um, my exploration of the upstream there is that it is solidly a parking lot and the rooftops of that apartment complex. Is there any chance of breaking up the parking lot and putting, um, I mean, I know it's private, so, um, but talking to the owners and seeing if, if they could break it up and plant some trees? I mean, it would have to be up to the owners, as you said. And as far as, you know, parks, we're essentially just another landowner in the county and all we can really control is the land that we own. Um, so it could be worth, you know, you as neighbors talking to the apartment, it could be worth, you know, the county talking to the apartment building. Um, you know, both of you would probably have more weight talking to them than we would. I mean, you know, any little bit would help, but as I said, you know, we're not on the brink of, of an impaired watershed there as far as our impervious percentage, we're, we're well into that. Um, yeah. So we, we'd be talking, you know, mass changes in, in a very developed area, but again, any little bit um, you know, it definitely couldn't hurt and any little bit could help. It's just, we might not see the effects of it, but yes, I mean, you're completely right. There's, um, kind of seas of asphalt immediately upstream and, and this stream is in storm drains until it gets in to that outfall where yeah. we're starting. Yeah. So. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Well, I hand it back over to you and if we're, <laughs> how are you doing on your, um, you know, I think we had a pretty um, good run through of most of the questions. I think we hit some of those. You have um, our contact information, so you're welcome to follow up with any of us. I did see some questions about, you know, would you like to know about critter sightings and that sort of thing. Um, and Valeria chimed in sharing that iNaturalist is a really great tool for documenting some of that. Um, but if you want, to reach out directly um, and let us know, you're more than welcome to, because we are looking at 
um, the stream biological communities specifically. So the amphibians, reptiles, fish and bugs, if you have a question about them, um, I can do my best to answer them and have wonderful support staff um, to help as well. Very good, very good. Uh, I'm gonna turn my video back on here and I hope the connection doesn't, doesn't disappear. <laughs> but I wanted to be back in order to say thank everybody for coming and thank you, Rachel and Aaron and Jackie and Doug and Valeria, who's um, much anticipated. We are very glad to have someone covering the volunteer area. Sorry, she had to leave, but that's the way it goes. Um, and thank everybody, all 24 of you still here. <laughs> thank you so much for coming. Um, now I did record this and I'm gonna push stop at this point because I caught the, the um, 